into heaven. It's a wonderful thing. And today we're talking about the feeding of the 5,000. And the principle of the feeding of the 5,000, when we leave church today, our youth department is going to feed you, not the 5,000, but to feed the multitudes. So when we walk out the doors after church, we're going to go out these doors, and the youth department will be grilling out some hot dogs and some chips and stuff for you. And uh, when you walk out, we want to feed you as well, feed your kids. All the parents said, amen. Don't have to go to Carlos O'Kelly's today or something. So that's good. So I titled this sermon, The Only Word That Jesus Does Understand. But you would say, well, that's not very theological because Jesus is omnipotent. Jesus knows everything. So I kind of changed it to the only word that Jesus won't let you use. And I think there's a word there that uh, we understand. How many of you know two different languages? Raise your hand if you know two different languages. Good job. Do you know they say the English language is the hardest one to understand? The English language... Would you move from your mother? You're just like her. Move over one. The English language is the hard one to understand. Let me give you a couple ideas. Say that you come to America and you're trying to learn English for the very first time. Uh, words can be hard to understand, especially in the English, English words. Um, for instance, someone wrote, English is a crazy language. There is no egg in eggplant. There's no ham in hamburger. Quicksand works slowly, and boxing rings are square. And why is it that writers write, and fingers don't fing, and hammers don't ham, and vegetarian eats vegetables, but what does a humanitarian eat? <laughs> People recite at plays, and play at recitals. We ship cargo not by cars, but by trains, and send cargo by ships. We park on driveways and drive on parkways, we have noses that run and feet that smell. Some of you do. How can a fat chance and a slim chance be the same thing while a wise guy and a wise man are opposites? Your house can burn up as it burns down. You will fill a form out by filling it out. When the stars are out, they are visible, but when the lights are on, they are invisible. How can flammable and inflammable mean the same thing? And when cars slow up, it slows down. English speakers should be committed to the insane asylum if they understand all the proverbs of the English language. See, today we're going to talk about a word. A word that Jesus will not allow us to use. He is not satisfied with that word. And the feeding of the 5,000 in Mark chapter 14, verses 13 through 21, is the feeding of the 5,000. And this story is the only story written by all four gospel writers. It is very paramount because there's some principles in here, and we all know about the feeding of the 5,000, and we could almost call that the feeding of the 15 or 20,000 because there was 5,000 men plus women and children. And you know wherever there's kids, there's going to be food, and kids can chow up that food, right? Anybody, anybody have any grazers at your house? They, they open that gro the refrigerator door all the time. There are four different accounts of this because it's so vitally important to God's principles and what we do. Um, when you examine all the details of this miracle, you'll see that there's some very simple principles. And these simple principles, we can talk about a story of feeding the 5,000 with five loaves and two pieces of fish. But it's not about the feeding. It's about what took place before the feeding. So as I read Matthew chapter 14, verses 13, 21, I want you to see if you could pick out the word that Jesus will never allow you to stay in. You can use it, but he will use it through you. It sounds in Matthew 14, 13 through 21, when Jesus heard that he had happened, he withdrew, let me say that, when Jesus heard what had happened, let me tell you what had happened. His cousin, his name's John the Baptist, was just beheaded. He was beheaded and Jesus went into this mourning period for somebody that he loved. John the Baptist was the forerunner, the cousin of Jesus. And because John the Baptist stood up and called out Agrippa, then what happened is he was beheaded. And the words came to Jesus. And imagine if you would 
somebody that you loved, maybe it's a family member that you just lost. You just lost and they just died and, and at hands of a violent death. Automatically, if we love somebody that we heard that had died, we would go through a mourning period. So Jesus is now, he heard what had happened. He said, I'm going to go on to the other side of the lake and I just want to have some alone time. Anybody ever need an alone time? You need some alone time. When things, this world, this tragedies take place, sometimes we just say, you know, I'm going to call in sick for a couple of days. I'm just going to be by myself for a couple of days. I, I have the right to mourn and we all mourn differently. And Jesus was mourning that process and he wanted to go on the other side of the lake and he just wanted to talk to his father. When Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by the boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. There were about 210 towns around the Sea of Galilee. And he had compassion for them, and he healed their sick. As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place, and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go into the village and buy for themselves some food. Jesus replied, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. We have here only five loaves of bread and two pieces of fish. They answered, bring them here to me. And he said, and he directed his people to sit down on the grass, taking the five loaves and the two fishes, looking up to heaven. He gave thanks and broke the loaves. And he gave them to his disciples, and his disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up the twelve baskets of broken pieces, and that were left over. The and the number of those who ate was about 5,000 men, besides women and children. The disciples said they only had five loaves of bread and two pieces of fish. That's all they had. We only have that. And Jesus heard what he said. He said, give it to me. Give it to me. The principle before we get into the message is, what is it that you only have? I'm only gifted in this area. I don't have a lot of money. I don't have a lot of talents. And you say, Lord, what is what I have amongst so many? So I want you to picture in your mind's eye, how many of you guys have been to Coke Arena and watched Wichita State play basketball game? Or watched it anyway. Here's the mindset. 15,000 people filling up Coke Arena and you have five biscuits and two sardines. Fill them up! In the flesh you would say, Im absolutely impossible to do that. And God said this, with you, it is impossible. With me, all things are possible. So I want to bring that principle to you in a couple of different ways. And it's very simple. But this principle of only can change the way that we see God and what God can do with us. The first point, the compassion lesson. Jesus cares about all my needs. Jesus was hurting. His best friend, his cousin, his forerunner, was just beheaded. And he wanted to be alone. But his disciples took him to the other side and all these men and all these women followed him to the other side. Some of them were greedy. Some of them wanted to be healed. Some of them wanted food. But they all wanted to be around Jesus because they heard that Jesus was a, a miracle worker and he could do great things. So Jesus sat there with them with compassion upon his heart, seeing all these people that were hurting, that were struggling, that were destitute, that just needed a touch of Jesus, whether it was healing of their body or healing in their spirit or healing in their hunger. Jesus was sitting there and he said he had compassion for them. When he had compassion, he said this, I'm going to teach you. I'm going to teach you the principles of life. And then after I teach you the principles of life, I want to give to you something that can change your life. And he gave to them food to satisfy their bellies, not until he taught them the very words of God. He fed the people spiritual truth by telling them seven parables about the kingdom. You and I will have the spiritual needs of our Jesus met within our life if we listen to the very words of God. So, first thing you have to have before you can take your only and give it to Jesus, you have to have compassion. You have to have compassion for people that are hurting. In our society today, 
We're a very self-centered, arrogant society. It's the me first movement. What do I want? What do I need? If it was us and one of our best friends, one of our family members passed away, you would just say, time out. I've, I've been there. I don't want to talk to anybody. I, I want to curl up in my bed with the lights off and I just want to stay there for a couple days and I'll get out of this funk. But have you guys ever been in a funk? Or is it just me? When we get into a funk, we don't want to talk to anybody. We don't want anybody to tell you how great you are or what the world's going to take place. We just want to stay in our own little dark place and be alone. And Jesus was somewhat like that. He wanted to go to the other side of the lake. But yet when people came alongside him, he put his own needs on the back burner. And he saw all these people. And the Bible said he was moved with compassion. We have another word for that. He was moved with empathy. He felt their pain. And when we feel somebody's pain, we see that they're going through trials. We through the, they know that they're going through a time in their life where they can't handle it by their own. That's where we as Christ-like followers of Jesus come alongside them. But we will never satisfy their needs until we have compassion for them. The first lesson is that we have to see people hurting people in a way that we can come alongside them and help them. Sometimes we have to take our own pain, our own fear, our own anxieties and put it on the back burner and say, what can I help you with? What can I do for you? The second thing is the faith lesson. Jesus asked me to do the impossible to test me. Anybody ever been tested by God? Every day, right? We all get tested by God. We think it's Satan sometimes testing us, but Satan has no power over Jesus. And sometimes Jesus tests us. The disciples came to Jesus, let them send the people away to the village so they can buy food on their own. They, there were thousands of people in little villages all over the place, and the disciples looked at what they didn't have. And they looked at it and said, we, we don't have enough. If we used one year salary... We could only give somebody a bite of food. There's no way that we could feed 5,000 men plus women and children with our resources. We don't have it. There's no way we can do it. And Jesus looked at them and said, no, 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 no. He said this. Jesus said, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. Have you ever been to the point that you don't have very many resources and you have to do something. And you just say, I don't know what to do. And we fall on our face before God and say, God, give us some help and give us some wisdom on what we need to do. And Jesus looked at his disciples, 12 of them, and he said, he said they don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. And I'm sure they looked around and they piled all the disciples up there and said, what do you have? What do you have? What do you have? And Andrew found a little boy. And he said, what do you have in your sack? And he goes, he goes, that's my lunch. And when we hear five loaves of bread, we think this big old French loaf, right? We think this two and a half foot sub sandwich. That's not what he had. He had a Israel Happy Meal. He had a biscuit with little sardines. It would probably feed a little boy for his lunch. And he looked at that and he said, what is this? There's no way that God could do anything with this. And the disciples were probably thinking, okay, if we send them away, at least we have five biscuits and two, <laughs> two fish so I can eat, whether they eat or not. But Jesus said, no, 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 no. They don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. You know what Jesus has given to his disciples? A faith test. He's given to them a test. We look at that and say, what do we do with it? Jesus told his disciples, do something that is impossible. And the disciples looked at him and he said, I have no idea what to do. And Jesus was about ready to send his disciples out to do a miraculous miracle tour. And Jesus wanted to teach them some things. And the first thing is, you cannot do it on your own. You look at this and say, impossible. And then Jesus said this. Jesus asked us to do something that's impossible also. He's doing the test of faith. When I was in college, I had a professor that started off so once a week started off this, you know what he's going to say? Take a piece of paper and a pen out. You know what that meant, right? Test time. And there were some times I was prepared for that test, but probably 99.8% .8 of the time I wasn't. So I cheated sometimes and I got an F on the other times, but 
Sometimes Jesus does that same thing for us. He says this, take out a piece of paper. I'm going to give you a test. And so often we fail our test because we're not prepared. We see things in our physical eyes and what we think we can do. And Jesus doesn't want us to look at our physical eyes. He wants to look through our spiritual eyes. And James chapter 1 verses 2 through 3 says, Consider it all pure joy, my brothers, when you face trials of many kinds, because you know the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Once you realize the problems are God's pop quizzes in our life, God can do some certain things. So there's three ways that we can look at the tests of faith. Just like, just like the little boy that brought the five loaves and two fishes. The first one are feelers. And they say this, I feel this way. I feel God wants me to do this. And can I tell you something? Feelings are great, but feelings are very misleading. Just because you feel something is right doesn't mean it is right. And the way that we deal with feeling is apply it to the Word of God. So sometimes we feel these disciples looked in, he saw the multitudes of people, and they said, I can't do this. I'm scared to death. Send them away because there's no way we can deal with this. So sometimes feelings can be detrimental to our life. And I made up a word. I know somebody's going to text me this week and say, what you said here is not a word. So I'm making a premise that this word is not a real word. It's the English language and there's nothing good about the English language. Others are figurers. They, don't, they, they figure, but they try to figure things out. They address the problem with their mind's eye. You can recognize them because they say remarks like, I think. There are calculators, there's analyzers, they see things, they calculate it and say, I have this plus this plus this plus this, they want this, 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 and this, it won't work, so I quit. We look at our bank books and we said, I can't do this, so I quit. We can't give to God, we can't do because we're figurers. We try to figure out things that if I do everything I can do, it will work. And we put all of the pressure, all of the stress, all of the power that we have on our own abilities. And we don't bow our heads before God. And we don't ask God to figure things out. John's gospel, when he told Philip, make this statement about feeding the 5,000. Lord, a year's wages would not be enough to buy everyone a single bite. A year's wages. So look at the miracle that Jesus is about to perform. Look at your life. Look at your resources and your abilities. You look up at God and say, Lord, this is all I have. And a year's wages would not be enough to do what you've asked me to do. And Jesus says, we need to do this. Philip was the CPA of the disciples. Can't you see him? And he whips out an uh, iPhone 10 and tries to figure out how to make this thing happen. And it just cannot compute. And that is when God shows up. Have you ever witnessed God showing up in part of your life? You pull something out and you look at this and say, it is absolutely impossible. And Jesus says, do it anyway. I can't. Do it anyway. And when we do what God has asked us to do, God works those things out. A human mass says five loaves and two fishes divided by 15,000 is totally impossible. But God's math says Five loaves plus two fish times the power of God, 15,000 full stomachs. When we look at what God wants to do within us, it is impossible. But with God, everything is possible. The third thing is an abundance lesson. When I give Jesus only all that I have, he turns my poverty into plenty. The disciple said, we have only five loaves and two, and two fishes. Jesus says, bring them here to me. They used the only word, but Jesus acted like he didn't even understand it. He said, your only is enough for me to have plenty. Let me tie that in. There's feelers, there's figurers, and then there's faithers. Faith means this. God is bigger than me. God knows more than me. God, if the God of the Bible is absolutely true that I put my faith in, if I'm struggling, if I'm hurting, if I'm struggling with my family, if I'm struggling with my money, if I'm struggling with my job, my personality, my depression, Jesus says, 
give it to me. Because in your faith, when you give your hurts, you give your pain, you give your resources. I could, I could use this analogy, and if you were honest, you would raise your hand. Maybe a couple of you wouldn't, but most of you would. How many of you guys struggle sometimes with your finances? Uh, see, I could preach on finances all day long, and I hit everybody on the nose on that. And here's the biblical math principle. Give it to God. And when you give your pain, your finances, your family to God, great things to take place. Now, we do this certain thing about once a month or once every other month, and we got a bunch of little babies being born right now. How many of you guys have little babies uh, under a year old? Look at all these hands raised. Right Everybody has all these little babies. You know what we do at the church here with these little babies? We dedicate them to God. It's our only. Jesus gave his only begotten son. And we give our babies, we say, Lord, I want to dedicate this child to you. And we take this kid, and usually when I hold a kid during baby dedication, what happens? They cry. Hey, they cry. Like, like I'm a demon or something. They're scared to death of me. But I, every time I hold a baby, they cry. But what we do is we pray over these babies, and we dedicate these babies back to God. And we look at these babies, if they're your baby, you would say, that's my child. And we have to understand, it's not your child. It's God's blessing to you for you to train up that child and he will take care of it. So we have the feelers, we have the figurers, and then we have the faithers. But you cannot recognize a faither. A smile is always on their face and they always say things like this, I believe that God is able. I believe in my weakness, he can make me strong. I believe everything I have, when he takes care of it, he can multiply it. The little unnamed lad only had five, li five loaves of buns and two small fish and like sardines. And you said, this is an Israeli Happy Meal. And you know what God says through the window of the Israeli Happy Meal? Do you want to supersize that? Do you want to supersize that? And Jesus took his little Happy Meal and he supersized it big time. He supersized it to a point that everything works out. One of my favorite Bible promises says, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we could ask or think, according to the power that works within us. According to the power. Exceedingly, abundantly, more than we could ask or think. Not because of our power. I can't do any more exceedingly, abundantly, above all I can think. But God says he can do things with us and through us if we just trust in him within our life. So I want to give you four applications. What Jesus did in this story to take five loaves of bread and two little sardines and he changed the feeding habits of this congregation. And I think within our life, before we get into the application, what is it that you will say, I only have this. I only have my talents. I only have my personality or only have my resources. And, and we have our onlys. And sometimes our onlys is, our, is the way that we look at ourselves. And it's the inferiority complex sometimes within our life. And we look at that and say, that's the only thing I have. I really don't have anything really going for me. And Jesus says, if you give me these four principles and you reenact what I did, your onlys can be a priority within your life and a blessing to other people. And these are very simple. The first thing he did is he looked up to heaven. When the little lad gave him these five loaves and two fish, he took it and he looked up to heaven. He looked to heaven because Jesus knew that we have to have the power of God to take our onlys to be a supernatural resource. When Jesus took the food, the first thing that he did was he looked to heaven. When you face a need, you have been tempted or forced into a problem. Your meager resources will not work, but don't look to what you only have. Instead, lift up your eyes and look to a heaven, and here you can have his advice. And here's this advice in Psalm chapter 121, verses 1 and 2. It says, Lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. If you're at a point 
where you don't know what to do. Physically and emotionally and spiritually, we look to ourselves and say, how can I figure this out, right? What do I need to do? Do I need to get another job? Do I need to do this? Do I need to send my kids to a, to a discipline camp? <laughs> Many of us say, yes, well, that's what we need to do. But sometimes we have to lift up our eyes whenever we have a problem, whenever we need God to supernaturally work within our life. The Bible says Jesus lifted up his eyes into heaven. Like the song says, turn your eyes on Jesus. Look full to his wonderful face. And the things of this earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. So he looked up to heaven. Not only looked to heaven, but he gave thanks for the little that he did have. So often, we get mad at God because of our onlys. I don't have enough. But here's what Jesus says. Don't look at what you don't have. Be thankful for what you do have. And when you're thankful for what you do have, God can give you what you need to have. But sometimes we get mad at God and God says, just be thankful. He looked up to heaven and he said, Lord, thank you for what this little boy gave to us so we could multiply it to give to others. Thanksgiving is not just a holiday. It's the best way to approach God. The Bible says in, in, Roman, in Psalms chapter 100, he says, enter his gates with thanksgiving. When you are thankful, even in our own personal life, if your kids come up to you and every time they come up to you, they're upset, they're mad, and they're negative. You say, oh, would you just go to your room? But if your kid comes up to you, say, Dad, I want to say thank you for working so hard and diligently and providing for us. <laughs> what, what? What is all this? But when we are thankful to God, he's saying, my child has grown into maturity. Sometimes we look at what we don't have and we get mad at God because of what we don't have. But God's saying, why, don't you, why aren't you thankful for what you do have and give me blessing on what you do have? And sometimes we just need to give thanks for what we can do within our life. And here's the key. This is the entire key to the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. Cherish the value of brokenness. Cherish the value of brokenness. Jesus took the five loaves. He looked up to heaven. He said, Lord, thank you for what took place. It's only five loaves and two fish. But here's what Jesus did. He broke the loaves. He broke the loaves. And sometimes before Jesus can do the miraculous within our life, he has to break us. He has to get rid of the pride. And there's a, a phrase that I used to use all the time. I've been using it for a while. But it says this. When pride walks onto the platform, God walks off. And it's a thing about pastors and you've been around pastors that are full of pride. I got the best sermon in the world. I'm the greatest communicator. And they're so full of pride. And they're getting what they have because they think that they're good enough. And here's what the principle is. When you walk on that platform and you're full of pride, God hates the proud. And he walks off that platform. And in your family, you're the pastor of your home. And what we have to do is we have to get rid of our pride. And we have to be broken. I've been here for 20 years, and I, I'm not the same person I was 20 years ago. There have been things within this church and things within my personal life that God absolutely broke me with. I want to use the analogy of a vessel, a vase, if you would. Somebody had this nice vase worth thousands of dollars, and it was beautiful. And his kids were playing football in the house. You know what happens when kids play football in the house? The football hit the vase. And the vase fell over and cracked all pieces. So all the kids scattered. There was no one, no one at the house when the, and the parents came home. And the parents came home and looked at this thousands dollar vase. And, and they yell, who broke this vase? Who broke this vase? And the, not me. Anybody know it? Not me. Everybody's last name is not me. Not me. I didn't do it. So the dad took all the pieces. And he took it into the garage. And he used some solder. And he made that vase back to where it was. And sometimes we think of something as beautiful. But when it's broken, the kids were broken because they did something wrong. 
But God, through, his, through the dad, took that vase and soldered it back together as a beautiful vase again. You have a bike in our society today. These $100 bikes. Anybody have a $100 bike at Christmas time? You ride that $100 bike and you jump off a cliff and you hit the curb and the bike breaks within three weeks. And so what do we do? We try to fix the bike, but most cases they're throwaway bikes and we throw those things away because they're throwaway bikes. You buy that $200 TV that's 50 inch widescreen for 200 bucks and they last for a year and you try to take it in to get fixed and you say, well, we can't fix this. It costs you $400 to fix it to buy a $200 TV. So we just throw that broken TV away. Our society is a broken, throwaway society. But here's what the principle of Jesus is. He cannot truly use you until you go through some broken times within your life. And here's the broken time within your life. I cannot do this alone. I need Jesus. And through the brokenness of that bread, the miracle took place. He broke that bread and he put it in these baskets and he's told his disciples to go feed. He asked everybody to sit down on the grass in groups. And these 12 disciples took that broken bread and a little bit of fish. And he fed the multitudes. But he could not feed the multitudes until he first broke that bread. In Psalm chapter 51 verses 17, David said this. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a broken and contrite heart. Oh God you will not despise. A broken spirit and a contrite heart. When you have a broken spirit and you know, I just need God. Have you ever lost your job or have you ever had a kid go wayward and, and you really don't know what to do and you've done everything you could possibly do and you finally say, Lord, I need your help. I'm not the best parent in the world and I don't make enough money to do everything. So what we do is we fall on our face before God and as David sinned and sometimes as we live our life we can just say I am a broken individual. But here's the fourth principle. Serve others before myself. I can just imagine the little boy with the loaves gave that to Jesus and the disciples are sitting there saying well it's not enough but it's enough for us. And Jesus said this I want you disciples to feed them. Disciples said, by, by the time I feed 15,000 people, there will be nothing left over for me. And they're tired. They're with Jesus. And they thought of privilege and prestige that if they were beside Jesus, they should be eaten first. They should have all the, everything for their own self. And then they will have enough refreshment. And then they could feed everybody. But Jesus says, no, 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 no. They are more important than you. The least is more important than the first. And the Bible says, let the first among you serve the least among you. And Jesus told the disciples, take this bread, and he put it in baskets, and feed the multitudes. And when they fed the multitudes, you know what took place? There were 12 baskets of food left over. And how many disciples are there? 12. When we take our only, and we give it to God, and let him work with our only, and he gets done doing everything that we are broken about, and he comes back and he says, now take care of yourself. Get your eyes off yourself and put your eyes on God. And God can do great things. There's a story about that. And I want to close with this story. And it's found in Exodus chapter 3. Moses was about 80 years old. And the burning bush experience took place. Moses was a shepherd for his father-in-law Jethro. And uh, he was out in the woods just taking care of the sheep. And he walked over this hill and he saw this bush that was burning, but it wasn't being consumed. And he walked in there and he started walking up to that bush. And the voice of God came over that bush and he says, Stop. Where you are standing is holy ground. Take off your sandals. And the bush started communicating. And he said, he said I want you to go back to Egypt. And I want to take our people out of Egypt, out of bondage. And Moses, I stutter. I don't know what to do. I can't do this thing. I can't do this on my own. And how was Pharaoh ever going to listen to me? And then God, through the voice, told him a story. He said this, what's in your hand? And, Jesus, and Moses said, it's just my shepherd's staff. It's Moses' staff. And 
I've had it for a long time and, and now it's smooth and I don't get any splinters in my hand and, and I have to walk up and down hills. And he said, throw it on the ground. And Moses said, Lord, I have my bed and I have my staff and I work the fields and I really can't do it. It's just my staff. And God said, throw it on the ground. Just like we do. Okay, God, I don't want to, but that's what I have to do. And he threw it on the ground. And when he threw it on the ground, the staff of Moses turned into a snake. Anybody like snakes? You guys are crazy. I despise snakes. If I see a snake, we're playing golf. If I see a snake by the water, I'm, I'm out of there. I, I don't care if it's a garden snake or a, or a cobra. I'm done. I hate snakes. So Moses, this 80-year-old man, books away from the snake. And God says, stop. Go back and pick it up. And Moses said, no. <laughs> and he says, I want you to pick it up. So I'm sure Moses took the long way around the path, hoping that the snake is swithered out to the grass. But it was right there, coiled up. And God says, pick up the staff. And imagine, you know, how can I get that thing by the tail? But he picked it up, and then the snake turned into the rod. And from that point on, the staff of Moses was called the rod of God. Give me what you have. Throw it on the ground and let me use it. Just a few months later, Moses at the Red Sea, the sea here and the armies coming behind him and they were surely ready to die. And he lifted up his eyes to heaven. He says, God, what do you want me to do? And he said, what's in your hand? The power of God. Stretch it out. And he stretched the rod of God into the sea, and the sea parted. It's the only thing that he had. He didn't want to throw it down, he didn't want to give it away. But when we do what God has asked us to do and give him our only, we get the power of God within our hands. And when something unsurmountable takes place within your life, it's just not what I have. Now we have the power of God and we can look up and say, God, what do you want me to do? The testing of your faith produces perseverance so then we can do what God has asked us to do and we can have the power of God within our life. Sometimes we're anemic in our Christian faith because we've never been tested and we've never given our testing over to God and we say, I don't want to do this. I don't know how to do this. So I'm just not going, I may throw it down, but I'm going to walk away. I'm going to give it to you, but I'm not ever going to pick it back up. But when God tells us to do certain things in the testing of our faith, we have the power of God and we need to have that power of God when we want to be successful. In Exodus chapter four, verse 17, take the staff in your hand so you can perform miraculous signs with it. The Bible no longer calls it the rod of Moses, but it's called the rod of God. God is asking us to do the same thing. What's that in your hand? You say, it's my job. God says, lay it down. It's my bank account. God says, lay it down. It's only my family. Lay them before me. It's only my meager abilities. Don't understand what that word means. Lay it down. You may be thinking, I only have this much to give. He says, it's enough. Just give it. God has been performing miracles and onlys all of our life. But sometimes we just don't see the onlys. Sometimes we don't see what God can do within our life. Give what God has given to you. I came across this poem and expresses the point of this message. It's titled, My Little Only Word. It says, I considered my little and God said to me, Child, what you do with your saving is only me. It was only a word that carried all that you see. It was only some clay that brought you to me. Only a staff that parted the sea. Only a man to set us all free. 
Only a young shepherd who took down a foe. And there was a lesson to learn that only we should know. It was only a stable that only a girl. And only a carpenter who changed the whole world. It was not what you have, but my strength you see. And I could do a miracle if only you let me have your only. Your only can change the world. So I have this question. Our only. Your only. And my only. Whether it's in our insecurities. Or whether it's in our pride. Whether it's in our abilities. Or our bank account. You know God gave to us our life. And he gave to us our salvation. When we die we're going to heaven. And he says do not sacrifice the 70 years. That you're promised on this earth. For this life. Sacrifice your onlys. So God can use our power to produce others in you. So, what is your only? What is it that you hold on to? What is it that you're insecure about? What is it that you need to give to God? And if you're struggling, the, the miraculous math of God changes everything. I'm, this is not a sermon on tithing, but I'm going to give this testimony when you give to God he breaks you and you say I want to give that just give what you have give a portion of what you have and say Lord I'm going to look up to you and I'm going to say thank you for what you've given to me I want to give it to you see what God does not only through his work but within your life because what God can do through your talents, your time, and your treasures. He can give to you what you have. The staff of Moses. And you throw it back to God and say, okay, you asked for it. And you pick that back up. You can have the very power of God within your life. So, whether it's your kids, we need God's power within our kids. Anybody, anybody need that or is it just me? We all need help with our kids. Give our kids to God. If it's your job and you're struggling with your job and you say, I don't know how to handle this, give your job to God. Give your only job to God. If it's your depression or maybe it's your health, give your job, give your health, give your resources to God. Maybe it's your doubts. Maybe it's your fears. Maybe it's your spiritual condition. You're not happy where you are. You say, I've gone to church for 20 years. I just have some insecurities. I have some questions. Give your spiritual life to God. Let him take your onlys and transform your life to the very power of God. Will you please stand to your feet? I'm going to ask you, we all have our onlys. We all have our fears. We all have our questions. As Moses took this rod and it turned into the rod of God, as Jesus took these five loaves and two fish and he looked up to heaven and he acknowledged who Jesus was, who God was. And he said, I can't do this on my own. He blessed it and asked God to bless it. He broke it so it can be broken, so it can be multiplied. And then he served others. That same few principles that Jesus did is the same principles that God wants us to do. Where you're hurting family, faith, finances, job, insecurities, Whatever it is, call on the face of God and say, Lord, I need you. It's not just a prayer out of our lips. It's a prayer of faith. It's a faith test. Take out your paper and pencil and take this test. And at that test that God gives to you, there's only one complete true answer. It's I trust God for everything. I can't trust God for myself. I make stupid mistakes and I don't even agree with half the stuff I do. But God can be trustworthy in everything that he does. So if you're struggling, if you have doubts, you have fears, you have your onlys, lay it down at Jesus' feet and watch Jesus do something that you could never do on your own. Taking these five loaves of bread and two fish. That's not enough for a little boy. And he fed the multitudes. 
because of a willing servant's heart. Take get, it, get rid of your pride. Give it to God. And let's see what God can do. Let us sing this song. Respond to God. Lift up your hearts. Lift up your voice. Give God the thanks. And allow him to break you and change you for who he wants you to be. Let us sing this song. All these pieces broken and scattered. Thankful for that grace. Let's sleep for him this week. You guys have an awesome, blessed day. Don't forget to grab your snack on your way out. One, two, three, because you have brought me back with the riches of